Welcome to this session of the Beyond the Veil Summit with my guest, Suzanne Giesman. Our topic today is the preponderance of evidence. Suzanne Giesman, the founder and teacher of The Awakened Way, is a former Navy commander and commanding officer who is now a mystic, medium, and author. Her verified connection with those in the non-physical realms allows her to share a unique and personal perspective on ancestral healing. And I'm so delighted that she's with us today. Suzanne, thank you for being here. Welcome. Thank you, Lisa. I just love being part of this and helping share the messages of hope, as I call them. Absolutely. And uh, I think this is just a great way to start this out uh, because one of the things I love about your work is that you make it really clear that you are an evidential medium, meaning that you ask those in the spirit world, those those who come through to, to actually provide evidence that the interaction is real. So let's go ahead and start there and talk about why you feel it's so important to, to actually ask for evidence. It's vitally important, Lisa, because you don't always know when your client or in mediumship terms, we call the person receiving the reading the sitter, when your sitter needs validation. Some people know the spirit world is real and you could tell them your loved one is here and they love you so much. But if your sitter is not convinced or is skeptical and is grieving so desperately and needs to know that their loved one is still here, nothing will change their worldview like evidence. And so since we don't always know who's a believer and who isn't, when we get evidence every time, this brings healing and hope beyond any messages that can't be validated. Mm. Okay, so so when you're uh, you're teaching, you do teach classes in mediumship. Um, this is something that you can actually teach people to learn how to actually get evidence in addition to receiving messages. Oh yes, and it's just as simple as saying, "Ask and you will receive." The spirit world will give you whatever you want, especially if it proves to those who are here that they are here with us. So many people don't realize that. Sometimes you have to ask for the evidence and that you can ask for layers of evidence, detailed evidence, specific evidence. So until you realize that this is the game we play with those across the veil, some people are satisfied with less than evidential readings. Yeah, I can see how that would be where if you, some people are just so desperate to to connect with with their loved ones, and I can see how they would be um, willing to just take anything uh, as as evidence. Oh. So how yeah. can uh, how can people actually increase their discernment to where this really is evidence? This isn't just wishful thinking. Well, you simply ask, is there any way that this medium could have known these things? I have uh, examples of three different types of way knowing that this information comes from across the veil and not just from, for example, reading the sitter's mind. Would you like me to go into those? Do we have time for that? Oh, absolutely. Yes, please. Okay, so I, I call these not telepathy moments. Telepathy would be just reading your sitter's mind. But these types of things will show people that must have been my loved one. Number one, well, in addition to the medium feeling the personality and having an actual interactive conversation with the loved one, the medium knows this, but the sitter doesn't. So the types of things that change people's worldview is number one, when you have a what I call a drop in, that's when a spirit drops in on the medium when the loved one, the sitter isn't even present. And you can tell them things that came up when you weren't even present with them. They weren't expecting the visit and they give you evidence. A really excellent way that I know it's not telepathy when I do a reading is I'll get physical symptoms in my body that pertain to how the person passed. It's not always comfortable. I may get a sharp pain somewhere in my body and I tune in to say, is that me or is that the spirit? And why are they showing me this? And it's a very, very reliable way of knowing what symptoms they had before they passed. That's not just telepathy because that energy is being recreated in the medium's body. And then the third way, which is beautiful, that we know it's not just telepathy, is when the spirit gives the medium evidence of something going on in the sitter's life now or the sitter's family life now that they don't know 
or any information that they don't know and they have to go validate something somebody else knows. This happens in almost every reading that I do. For example, I gave a reading and the, the uh, spirit across the veil was showing me that there was something going on in Greeley, Colorado that day. And the woman said, I don't know anybody in Greeley, Colorado. And later that day, her mother called her and she said, oh, I had such a good day today. I was at a dog show in Greeley. So the dad across the veil knew, of course, where his wife was, her mom. And it's just beautiful validation that so do the spirits know. That's a great example. In fact, let me go ahead and share this. Uh, right before you came on the line, the, the lamp over my shoulder here uh, just flickered on and off. And it's never done that before. And uh, so when I told you about it, you said the first thing you heard was mom. And that lamp belonged to my mom. <laughs> and so, I mean, right there, uh, that to me is it's sort of goosebump raising. That was, uh, was very But even more specific, you mentioned that yesterday would have been her birthday, right? Uh, no, and actually, she passed ones, two years ago. Oh, okay, so yeah. her angel date is what we call it. So these special dates, like birthdays and the days that they pass, they're always much closer because we're thinking about them so much on the, those dates. So it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I, I thought that was just fascinating. Uh, so, so we were talking about how people can... Um, trust the the evidence if people are learning to be their own medium and uh, that's where I think they might be more uh, prone to believing in uh, what they might see as evidence which might again be the wishful thinking so if you're if you're learning to do this how can you tell if the evidence is real well, if you're actually connecting with another spirit, whether it's your own loved one or somebody else's loved ones, you put them to the test and you say to the spirit who you sense, tell me something that I don't know. I put my own loved ones to the test. My mother showed up on my birthday this past week, and it was a beautiful gift for me because we shared a mutual birthday. And I rarely hear from her since she passed two years ago. And there are reasons for that that have to do with my soul's growth, but it was such a treat to feel her presence, to hear her voice and her tone. And even though I knew it was mom, she didn't tell me anything I didn't know. So I said, mom, I'm going to tell my brother and sister that you visited. Please tell me something going on in one of their lives right now that I don't know about. And she immediately went like this. She rubbed her chin. She showed me my brother had been thinking about his beard, a beard. I know my brother, when he grew his beard, it came in gray. And he said, he's never going to grow another beard. But I have to trust my mom. I called my brother and I told him this. And he said, that's impossible. If she got that, then she's in my thoughts. Because I was sitting there the last three out of four days thinking, oh, if I let my beard grow again, it's going to come in gray. And I said, well, you have to understand they are in our thoughts. It's how we communicate with them. He didn't want to hear that, but uh, it's true. <laughs> wow. So, well, now this brings up a, a question of my own. How often are they actually around watching us? Like, uh, you know, are, are they in the shower with us? Uh, how much privacy do we actually have? I will tell you that I have some people who actually hear from spirits when they're in the shower because it's something about the water and the energy. But spirits respect our privacy. I'll tell you that first and foremost. But they are around depending on how much you need them and how much they want to visit you. There are some partners, spouses that I brought together from across the veil with their spouse here. And they say, I'm hanging around until they're okay and standing on their own two feet again. And others give us more breathing room. If it was a parent, you wouldn't expect them to be around all the time if you're an adult now. But when you think about them, they do draw near. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. I, it's it's funny. I just, I didn't mean to necessarily use that as an example, but uh, many years ago after my father-in-law passed, I was taking a shower and he was there and it wasn't because he wanted to watch me take a shower. He was just there. And I said, you know, Pa, I'm in the shower. Let's talk another time. And, and I, I felt his presence disappearing. So it's interesting you say that they do uh, somehow the, what is it about the water that, uh, that draws this kind of communication closer? 
I feel that we're in a state where we're more sensitive because we have all of our tactile senses feeling that that entered the water flowing over our body. Our minds are a little bit more stilled. We're not running around. And so we just kind of open. We're relaxed because it's usually hot water. And so it's just a very nice environment for sensing beyond the normal physical waking consciousness. Right. Okay. Thank you for that explanation. Um, now, uh, getting back to uh, asking for proof, I know that some people, again, people who are rather new at this, who are learning, they feel sort of uncomfortable asking for proof from the other side. Uh, but I understand you have a different take on this. Oh, I would just say in my former Navy officer way, get over it. Because <laughs> the spirits, like I said, they want you to know they're here. They just imagine the joy that the loved ones here feel when the evidence comes through. I mean, to this day, I've, I've been doing readings for over a decade. I'll go, yay, you know, and I'll clap when I get a good piece of evidence. That just raises the energy. Why wouldn't the spirits cooperate and give us those beautiful, what I call gold nugget pieces of evidence? Yesterday, I gave a reading to a woman whose daughter had passed. And that daughter told, showed me that she once had a job. It was not a big career, just a small part-time job. And she wore a name tag for that job. And her mom said, yeah, and that name tag sits on the little shrine I have for her now. That's what we're talking about, the gold nuggets that you're not going to find that on Facebook or Google. Heaven forbid a medium would look somebody up. But it's you go for those, those special pieces of evidence that say, see, I know about that, mom, and I'm right here. Right, right. Yeah, th thank you for, for adding that about uh, that somebody might look up information. So yeah, you do look for something that isn't broadcast across Facebook. Uh, now, uh, you also mentioned being a Navy officer, which I personally think is fascinating because you you obviously came, uh, came up in the world through a very strict discipline, uh, probably not believing in this kind of thing. Uh, I imagine you're probably very skeptical about mediumship. And now, of course, you're not. How do you actually deal with skeptics? And how did you get over your own skepticism? Well, I'll say that I wanted to believe. I was fascinated with the concept of mediumship, but it wasn't until my stepdaughter passed that I needed to believe. But I didn't want to be gullible, just like you mentioned earlier, Lisa, and in, in my vulnerability, believe anything. That medium that we went to needed to give us evidence. And I went into it skeptically, but open-minded. And so there's a phrase that all thinking people are skeptical until they've been satisfied by ample evidence. So I think that that gives credence to the fact that it's good to be skeptical. Evidence can help you get over it, but it's most important to be open-minded as well. There are closed off skeptics that aren't gonna be changed even by the most stunning evidence. And readings will fail when you have a closed-minded skeptic because that's their lesson to learn. They get exactly what they create. Interesting. Okay, so if you're reading for a very skeptical sitter, is it that you the information doesn't come through to you or that they don't believe what you're saying? Their, their energy and their mindset actually blocks the connection. As I teach in my classes, I call this the sacred triangle in a reading, the medium, the sitter, and those in the spirit world. All need to be radiating a nice open energy, love-filled energy, like giving a green light to the spirit world. So here's the medium pumping out the love, and here's the skeptic, arms crossed, closed down, not going to believe anything you say anyway. What does that do to the energy field? So again, you, you, they create that failure. It's very interesting. I just won't do readings unless someone says, I'm open to this. I'm skeptical. That's okay. But if they go into it saying this is total nonsense, why even bother? I don't need to change anybody's mind. The evidence will do that. Right. That, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but have you ever had a circumstance, though, before you uh, refused to take uh, skeptics where you were trying to read somebody and they they were closed off, but perhaps their loved ones were like, hey, and <laughs> smacking their oh. way through? This is how I actually learned about the value of what we radiate. I was doing a reading and I 
everything I was saying was getting no from my sitter. And it was it was embarrassing. It was awkward because it's not how I operate. I was, you know, I'm sensing this or that. No, no, no. At the time I was working with my eyes open. These days I work with my eyes closed, but I open my eyes and my client has arms crossed, legs crossed, scowl on her face. And I said, well, no wonder. I told her, do me a favor, uncross your arms and legs, move your awareness to your heart and send out love. And we'll do this again. She did that. I did that. And I went, whoa, you've lost a husband. And he passed from an aneurysm and he was an engineer. And she said, yes, yes, yes. What made the difference? It was her fear and grief that caused her to be like this. It wasn't skepticism, but that is definitely a lower energy that was not aligned with the field we're trying to create in that reading. So it showed me that all of us create just the right energy for a reading and the sitter is just as important as the medium. Hmm. Okay, interesting. Now, so I imagine your life must be a hundred percent different uh, before becoming a medium to after becoming a medium. Can you talk about what different ways your life has actually changed as a result of this new skill, I guess, that you've developed? Is that what you'd call it? Yeah, I was thinking when you said a hundred percent, not a hundred percent, because I know I used to be very loving and very enthusiastic. I've always had those traits, I hope, but so much more so now. But the biggest difference I feel is my acceptance of everybody where they are and how they are, understanding that we're all on our own paths. The peace that I feel in every moment, the whole coronavirus uh, challenges that we're going through, I'm able to ride that out with, with peace and see it from a different perspective. Uh, I try to judge people far less that those when those natural human tendencies pop up, I'm aware of them right away. And all of this comes because I know that I have to work on myself to raise my vibration if I want to have a nice clear connection across the veil. So it's a beautiful fringe benefit of being a medium that our own lives become so much more peaceful and love filled. Mm. Right. Now, since you brought it up, if you don't mind, would you talk a little bit about COVID? You know, not getting into the politics, of course, but uh, what what is your experience with what we're all going through right now? This is a normal uh, growth opportunity that life has provided since life on Earth began. Everybody is new for us because for generations we haven't had something like this. But look at history. And my guides have told me we go through these cycles. It's not a punishment. It's a natural process of evolution and things moving onward. It's challenging, but it's also an opportunity for all of us to, to go within to find answers, to go within to rise above the fears that this engenders in us. So there's always a different perspective, and this certainly offers us that perspective. Yes, indeed it does. Um, yeah. but let's get back to the, the classes that you've taught. You, you've taught a few classes with the Shift Network, and, and they're, uh, they're very popular. Uh, we, you get a lot of people registering. Uh, what's it like to teach uh, an online course, people that you can't see in person? Uh, how does that work? I've had to let go my military training where you have to have the same outcome every time, teaching to a standard. With mediumship, everybody's going to to come up with their own style, develop their own style of working. I try to show people certain parameters and what's really important, things such as do no harm, don't hurt anybody in this work, and ask for evidence. But people will receive information in different ways. So with such large numbers in these classes, I can't check up on and validate everybody's progress. So I teach people how to determine if you should be doing readings or not. And as a medium, the test of any good reading is, did your sitter leave that session and say, that was my loved one. I mean, that is the greatest thing we look for. And if the majority of your readings don't have that result, then you go back to class or just, we should always be trying to improve. I'm constantly looking for improvement in myself. It's an ongoing journey. And I just love the enthusiasm that I feel from the students as well. 
Yeah. Now, do you find uh, in your experience, both in 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 person classes and the online uh, courses, do most people uh, want to learn how to do this because they want to be professional psychics or because they simply want to be able to communicate with their own loved ones? I'd say it's actually three reasons, and I don't have the numbers, but it's a very even proportion want to con- learn to be mediums, and then the other proportion wants to connect with their own loved ones. But then across the board, people want to raise their own consciousness. And again, that's a natural outcropping, a result of the work. Hmm. Okay. Now, I know you do have another uh, course coming up. Uh, you, this will be your yeah. third mediumship course. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. And and they're not that one is more advanced than another. The last one was called the next level of mediumship, not because you had to be an advanced medium to attend it, just that it was more teaching. But this one is going to have a specific focus. It's going to start in December. We'll, we'll have a beautiful video about it, I believe, in November. But it's going to be about soul to soul mediumship, how this communication doesn't happen from the human Suzanne connecting with the soul. It's the soul. So it's all about the things we've been talking about, Lisa, how working on our own soul's growth and evolution increases that connection. It's just a lot of good tips on how we can raise our consciousness and the results are fantastic. Wow. Okay, cool. Now I know that the summit that we're actually talking here for airs like days before Halloween when the, uh, the veil between the world is, is thinnest. What are your thoughts on that? Do you believe that that's true? I have no experience of that. That's my good Navy answer for you. As when I was the briefing officer for Admiral Cedar, they'd ask you, and if I didn't have an answer, I didn't have an answer. I, I have no personal experience of that. I know that there are cycles, but uh, I haven't experienced it, Lisa, so can't comment. <laughs> okay, well, I thought I'd, thought I'd ask anyway. Uh, now, I understand that you have a, a process that you'd like to share to to, to guide our viewers through uh, uh, for the purpose of connecting with loved ones who have passed, uh, connecting through writing. Would you like to go ahead and do that? Yes, right. because so many people feel that they don't, hold, a, they can't hold the connection with the loved one when they connect with them. And writing, when you get into an expanded state of consciousness, is a beautiful way to, to stay in an expanded state of awareness and communicate with your loved one. So grab a piece of paper and something to write with, or maybe you have a tablet there, something that you can type on. You can do this by typing. Every morning I get messages from my guides and I type it in an iPad as I'm receiving it. So while you grab that, I'll just talk to you for a minute here about the process that I use to get into an expanded state. I teach this in all my courses, and it's even online because it works so well to take us from our busy, active daily life to just the right state that we need to shift our focus to those in the spirit world. Anytime you do this process, please begin with a very clear intention. And our intention for this this practice right now is to connect with someone who has passed, someone near and dear to your heart, to ask them a question which you're going to write down and listen and write down what you receive in reply. So that's our goal. So I'm going to use my seven step bless me method. That's an acronym for the steps I'll take you through, which are breathe, lift your vibration, expand your field of awareness, surrender the story, shift to the spirit world, merge with those you're going to connect with and experience. It's during that experience stage of this process that you'll do the writing. So by now, hopefully you have a piece of paper in front of you and you have your pen. You can hold an expanded state of awareness even while writing. So just know that believing it will help you to do it. So sitting comfortably, hopefully your feet are flat on the floor Let's just, with that intention of connecting with a loved one, bring them to mind. And let's imagine a shaft of white light around us. And it's connecting us to the heavens and anchoring us deep into the earth. I'm going to close my eyes and you can close your eyes too. That'll help me be guided as I guide you. So let's begin with the breath. 
Take in a nice deep breath into the belly, but exhale longer than you just inhaled. That triggers the relaxation response and helps you to start slowing down. Let's take in another nice deep breath. And this time as you exhale, become aware of your physical body and release any tension you're feeling anywhere in your body. Just let it go. Take in a third nice deep breath. And as you exhale, nice, long and slow, release any stress or lower vibrations you've been carrying around with you. They don't serve you at all right now. So you should already be feeling nice and calm and relaxed, a big shift from just a few moments ago. Now we're going to continue breathing slowly and automatically. And to lift our vibration, move your awareness to the heart and bring to mind someone or some th something that you love with all of your heart. It could be a beloved pet. And feel that feeling of love that wells up in your heart. Picture that as a light and turn that up. Turn the light brighter, filling your energy field in the shape of a sphere around your physical body. Make it brighter and brighter now. Bring to mind something you're grateful for. Gratitude instantly brings you to a state of coherence. Nice, even brain waves, heart waves, all of your body's systems in resonance. As you think of, I'm so grateful for this. What else are you grateful for? All right. You should be feeling a nice lift in your vibration now. You should feel lighter, a bit happier. We'll add one more little lifting practice. Visualize a favorite place in nature. And go there in your awareness. See it in your mind's eye. Hear the sounds around you. Be fully present in that visualization, in that experience. As you've just done these lifting practices, turning up your light, the person in spirit you want to connect with sees your light growing brighter. You're making yourself available to them in this beautiful way. Now picture that sphere around you filled with light. And we're going to take in a breath. And now as you expand, exhale forcefully, expand the edges of that aura. Do it with me. You're no longer a limited, finite sphere of light. You are the entire field of light itself. And in that state of awareness, you can connect with anyone with ease. Now we're going to surrender our focus on our limited self, the one you put your name on. Simply willingly state, I surrender and set that aside. Without the story, what remains? You, the beautiful light. Those you're going to connect with in the spirit world are here because you've called them with your thoughts and your intention and your belief. To meet them at their level, you simply state shift and shift your awareness to them. Just like that, you are meeting them in conscious awareness, not in a geographic location. They are here. They have always been here when you call on them. Trusting this is so, having gone through this process, invite them to step completely into your awareness now and merge energy fields. It's a blending of soul energy. It's very familiar to it as souls. You do it all the time, but now you're doing it in awareness. Take a moment and experience any different sensations. Do you feel the presence of your loved one? What do you sense? What has shifted?
And now in awareness of how it feels to be in this expanded state and knowing you can maintain this state of relaxation, pick up your pen. You can open your eyes and look at your paper and not lose that beautiful, expanded, peaceful state. And your loved one is not going anywhere. So write down a question for your loved one. They're right here. They'll read over your shoulder. You don't even need to write it. They hear your thoughts, but let's write it now to cement it. Write your question for that loved one who's here. Trust me, now that you've asked so specifically, they will answer. So pause now and listen. Don't wait too long. Start writing. You can actually start with imagination. Your loved one will pick up the ball and run with it. So start writing and see what flows. If you sense nothing at all, you can actually write nonsense and then ask your loved one to write something clearly for you. Play with this. Enjoy the process. Write down a second question. Wait and then write what you hear in response. Because we only have a limited time, this walks you through the process. But once you get in this expanded state, you can carry on an extended conversation. Entire books have been written with those across the veil in this way. And it's as simple as expanding your awareness, inviting the loved one in, merging consciousness and writing. So for now, Please, from your heart, tell your loved one that this has been a practice session, but that you look forward to doing this with them again. Set a time to get together, repeat the process, and enjoy that connection. For now, open your heart wide and send gratitude for what has been experienced. Even if you didn't sense anyone, even if you feel you are making it up, gratitude keeps the energy high, and we'll keep you coming back for more. So thank them and just bring your awareness back into the body, shifting back into the role you're playing here in a physical body. Wiggle your fingers and toes, take an energizing breath and welcome back. Know that your loved ones are going to hang around. They're going to want to do this with you again. So carry on a conversation. I can guarantee you they hear you. All right. Thank you so much for that. I can see how that could be a very useful tool. Um, it, it feels like doing this process, you're actually meeting them halfway. So I'm wondering then when you're not, if you have never done this process before, and you do find that they're doing things like making your lamp blank, or my mother-in-law used to uh, somehow make her, her music box play on her birthday every year uh, for a couple years after she <laughs> passed. And I'm not meeting them halfway. How, I don't want to use the word difficult, but how challenging is it for them to reach into this realm if we're not making the effort to meet them halfway? The image that I'm being shown right now is somebody that's hovering and just waiting for just the right moment. If I'm picturing like, uh, you know, the clouds from hurricane maps that we see with the big swirling. And if you were an airplane and you had to land, you would have to go right through the eye, right? 
And so the spirits are like, we're waiting till their energy opens up and provides just that opening that they'll be able to sense me. Oh, look, it's three o'clock in the morning and they're just at that right sleep stage. I'm going to drop in on a dream. They drop into your awareness or, oh, look, they're in the shower and their mind is drifting in there nice and relaxed. I'm going to drop into their awareness. This is a model to explain it, but the metaphor of meeting them halfway is an excellent metaphor, but that takes us back to human perception of distance. Everything is happening here and now in consciousness. They're simply realities that are out of phase, not a halfway. We adjust the frequency through our efforts, through the process I led everybody through. We come into phase and here they are because there's nowhere else they could be, but here in awareness. All right. Well, thank you for that. That made so much sense. You're very clear now. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the clock here. I want to make sure that before we go any further in our conversation that I mentioned uh, you have two websites. Uh, one is SuzanneGiesman.com and the other one is DailyWay.com. Uh, which of these two which of these two would be better to connect with you uh, what does each different site have to offer sure suzanne is my main website and it is full of gifts med free meditations tons of videos and uh, lessons practical tools all kinds of information people get lost in there sometimes the daily way is the daily messages i receive from my guides and spirits sanaya and that page is actually on my website but dailyway.org is a way to get directly to each day's inspirational message which so many people read and say they were talking to me today because we're all going through this human experience and they address the human challenges hmm. Wow, interesting. Thank you. Um, so again, we're, we're just about out of time. Uh, is there anything that we've left out that you want to make sure that we do talk about before we wrap it up? Yeah, there sure is. And, and that's that we called this talk the preponderance of the evidence. And so many people focus on the science aspect, Lisa, of connecting across the veil. And they say, we don't have proof that the spirit world exists. What they leave out is we have another whole way of proving things in our society. And that's our judicial system. We don't need scientific technology to prove a case. We use evidence. People's testimony, witnesses' testimony has been enough to prove many cases. And what proves a case in our society is called the preponderance of the evidence, which means that only you have to come to that the only logical conclusion that can be drawn from the evidence is that a particular proposition is true. And the preponderance of the evidence means 51% or more believable. Well, I'll tell you, if I gave a reading and we only had 51%, that wouldn't be good enough. If you have a good evidential medium, 80 to 90 to 95 percent of the things that come through are verifiable and evidential. So our technology currently does not allow us to sense the spirit world. So scientifically, we can't prove it. But using the burden of proof, which has sent people to jail, taking away their freedom, we use that as a standard for proof. And mediumship goes far beyond the highest standard set by our legal system. I think that's pretty cool and worth paying attention to. Yeah, thank you for adding that. I think that really added a, uh, an extra dimension to help us understand uh, what you're saying here about evidence. So uh, thank you, Suzanne, for being with us today. This has been just a fascinating conversation. I could I could keep talking to you for hours, of course, uh, but uh, your time is, is valuable. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Lisa. It's always a joy talking with you and sharing with anybody that, that tunes into the Shift Network as a kindred spirit. We, we know there is a greater reality, but for those who don't, learn how to get the evidence and you will bring more people along on this beautiful journey. All right, indeed. Well, once again, thank you, Suzanne Giesman, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed this conversation in the Beyond the Veil Summit. 
Thank you for joining us for the Beyond the Veil Summit, brought to you by the Shift Network. To learn more, visit beyondtheveilsummit.com. To join our global community of people awakening to their divine humanity and taking inspired action, visit theshiftnetwork.com. Thank you again for gathering with us and for sharing this healing path with your friends and family. 